just let you let you in on it that you know this is time for the biannual reviews, and uh, <laughs> so I really need you to laugh at all of my jokes. And at the end of the service, when I ask who wants to get saved, everybody needs to raise their hands. And then, uh, you know, walk up to Pastor Danny, and, and when you get the survey that asks how the service went, make sure you put excellent and that it changed your life forever. And uh, notice, of course, I didn't say make it better. It just changed your life. You know, like the good and bad in that, amen? Uh, we're going to start off in Luke chapter 10, and uh, we're going to bounce around a little bit, but hopefully not too much. I'm sorry, I just, I need another one of those. I know. Can you mute this for one second? Thank you. Okay, we're back, hopefully, for good. Luke chapter 10, uh, we're going to start off and read this passage, and it's a familiar scripture that, and a familiar story, parable that all of us know, and we're going to get into it a little bit, and uh, we're just going to see where God goes, amen? amen? Okay, there's a clock back there, praise the Lord. I have a watch, but I never, I always forget that I have a watch. It says, and behold, verse 25, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law, and what is your reading of it? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly, do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by a chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. In this particular passage of Scripture, it's a story, like I said, we've all heard this story many, many times. And what's going on is a lawyer comes to question Christ. He comes to make an argument with Christ. He's he's really there because he wants to justify himself, as it says a little bit later on in the the Scripture, but he's there to to kind of see what what Christ is going to say. He wants to, if possible, expose something in him or see if there's a weakness there or get him to say something that maybe he doesn't agree with or the people don't agree with. So he's not really there looking for an answer on what he should do. And, and what you find out is he asks a question to start the, the, the conversation. And the question he asks in and of itself is really a pretty good question. He asks, what shall I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And when you look at that whole statement about what shall I do, it's how shall I act? How shall I behave to inherit the kingdom of God? What shall I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And when I heard that question, I, I, I thought to myself as I read it, I thought, you know, That's a question that I believe that we as a church, we as the body of Christ, need to ask ourselves, especially in the day and age that we live in, right? Especially with everything that's going on in society and everywhere you go around the world today, no matter where it is, your belief system, your belief structure, what you believe in as a Christian is being challenged. It's it's being degraded. It's being mocked. It's being made fun of it. And and there are decisions that are are being made that affect what we believe, that challenge what we believe. And so when you think about it, it, it's very easy to have something rise up inside of you that isn't supposed to rise up inside of you. You know, it's very easy to respond in a way that you shouldn't respond. And what I believe is that we need to ask ourselves as the body of Christ, What shall we do? How shall we behave or act to inherit the kingdom of God? I love the way Christ responds to him. 
I, you know, I, I think parents do this really well. And I, I remember as a, uh, when I was younger, I'd go and ask Pastor John for, for, I had some question that was on my mind, something I was rallying around up there. And I said, you know, Pastor John, I really like to get your input on this. You know, what, what do you, how, do you, how do you read this? How do you see this? And he would smile and then he would pause for a second and he would go, well, let me ask you a question. Everybody ever get that? Yeah. Doesn't that make you mad when you're the one asking the question? And so I'd ask him, you know, what, what, what do you think? Well, let me ask you this question. And inevitably, what would end up happening is you ended up coming back to the point where you answered your own question, right? And that's what we're going to see is going to happen in this story as well. So he, he asked a question, and when, he, when, 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 um, when Christ responds to him, he says to him this. He says, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And, and when, when he says that to him, can't you see what Christ is saying to him? He says, look, you're a lawyer. You've studied the law. You know the law. Obviously, you're here with something other than what you've represented. So what do you think it says? You tell me what you read. You tell me what you think the answer says. And, and what the, what the uh, lawyer does is he gives an answer that is really quite profound when you look at it. It's not a simple answer. He kind of takes the, the, the Ten Commandments and he kind of takes the, the principles of them and he asks what, what many believe the two most important questions. He says to him, love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He quotes those knowing that really, in terms of the Ten Commandments, that that really kind of sums up everything about them, right? I mean, the reality of it is, is that if you love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your heart, you're really not probably going to erect an altar to another God, right? You're really probably not going to use the Lord's name in vain. You're really going to probably obey the Sabbath like you're supposed to because you're going to respect what the law means if you really understand it. And then when you get to the second part of it where it says, love your neighbor as yourself, well, you can kind of cut out the whole murder one. You can cut out coveting. You can cut out adultery because you love your neighbor as yourself, and you would never do that to yourself, right? So the, the reality of what he's talking about, the principles there are, are, are really true, and that's where he kind of he speaks it. So he says to, to Christ in his response, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And I thought to myself, okay, so that sounds really simple. But what does to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind really look like? What does it mean? And I just jotted down thoughts that came to my head as I thought about that. It says to love him and not ourselves. He is the object of our affections. He is who we spend our time with. He is ever at the forefront of our minds. That we admire him. We desire him. We look to him every chance we have. He is what we think of when we wake every morning and who we talk to before we sleep each night. All our efforts are geared towards pleasing him. We serve him because we love him. At our jobs, we work for him because it says to do all things as unto God. We live for him. We exist for him because he created us to worship him and him alone. And we love nothing else but him. You see, that's what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then you get to the point where it says to love your neighbor as yourself. What does that look like? That's not quite as easy as loving the Lord your God with all your heart. It seems like, I mean, in reality is it probably is just as hard. But, I mean, the, the reality of it is, is that, you know, it, it's impossible to love your neighbors yourself without Christ in your life. Right? There's just too much self in each one of us to love our neighbor and not have Christ inside of us. But we, we are able to love our neighbor because Christ is inside of us. And as a result of Christ being inside of us, he empowers us. And he gives us a he gives us a heart for the people that maybe we don't like so much, that we struggle with, that we have a hard time with, right? And, 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 it, and what's really he's talking about there is that in the middle of all that, the love of Christ should pour out from inside of us towards people we come in contact with. And it shouldn't matter what they look like, what they act like, how they behave. None of that should be the criteria. The criteria should simply be that this is how we're to behave because Christ is in us. And because Christ is in us, we shouldn't look at people and judge them. We should look at people and say, well, because you believe this, or because you act this way, or because this is your belief structure, I'm going to category, guy, excuse me, categorize you as this. See, that's my self telling myself to slow down. So, because when I start, I go, there's this alarm that goes off in my head, to so slow down, okay? So, because I like to talk fast. You know, I'm sorry. Um, so, when you begin to categorize people that way, that's not what Christ intended either. 
How can you love your neighbors yourself when you begin to segregate people into groups and, and because of what they believe or don't believe, you agree or don't believe in what they're doing? And you treat them differently. Maybe you even withhold love that you should be giving them because maybe you have a, 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 they offend you in some way. They create a, a, an issue in your mind in some way. You, you struggle with their behavior. Maybe you know that person is in sin, and so you, you kind of tend to keep them at an arm's distance. I love what Pastor Danny said last week about he's got lots of friends that are what? That are drug addicts or alcoholics or, or, or struggling with pornography or, or have maybe or, or, or committing adultery, whatever it is. That's not what defines that person as a human being in Christ's eyes. That's what defines them in our eyes. So the, the point is, is that we need to, to look at people and understand that, he, that Christ died for the sinner. That sometimes we get so caught up looking at the sin, we forget there's even a sinner involved. You just know the actions, and that's what pollutes the mind. And you forget that there's a soul at stake in the sinner. I had an opportunity about six months ago, eight months ago, I had a business trip that I went on. And at this business trip, the gentleman that was in charge of this trip as a whole, you know, it, it's very, over the, the course of about a week, you begin to recognize, you know, what, things that he would say about his partner and things that he would mention here and there. And I began to realize that obviously this, this man was homosexual. And as we got to know each other, and I, I you know, he was a, a nice man and he was very good at his job and he was doing a great job at the conference that I was at and the training that we were in. And at different times, a group of about 20 of us that were in this particular training, we would all go to dinner as a group and we would sit and talk. And it just depended on where, wherever you sat. And I usually, I always kind of wait for everybody to sit down. It's just what I do. I always let everybody sit down first and wherever the seat that's left is open, that's where I go. And it turns out it was like the second to the last night and I end up sitting right across from this gentleman. And he and I just began to talk about a book that I was reading and he was reading this, this other book. We began to chat and we were just having a nice conversation. And and I'm not exactly sure how, because there were some people sitting next to us that would kind of chime in on our conversation every once in a while. But somewhere in the middle of that conversation, he asked me a question, and I honestly don't remember what the question was. I said, but, oh, I said, well, you know, honestly, I don't believe that way because, you know, I'm a Christian and I believe in the, in the Bible. And he said, oh. And I go, you know, you, you say that, is there, do you not believe in the Bible? And he goes, well, he goes, I used to go to church. He goes, I used to believe in God. He goes, and then when I heard the pastor and people say these horrible things about me, about who I was, about the person I was, about, about what, what I was, and how they, they talked about it, very hurtful things, he said. He goes, I thought to myself, you know, I'm not going to go to a church or believe in a God that thinks that way about me. And so I said, you know what, I, I don't believe in God anymore. Because how could a God really think those horrible things, hurtful things about me? And why would I want to worship that type of a God? And I sat back, and I thought to myself, shame on us as a body of Christ. But what, what, what was amazing is, and it was a divine appointment by God. It was nothing that I had anticipated or ever imagined going on. But for the next hour, the next 90 minutes roughly, hour, hour and a half, I had the opportunity to share with this man what the love of Christ really is. I had the chance to tell him, listen, it doesn't matter who you are. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. God doesn't expect you to change and then come to church. He expects you to come to church and then he'll change you. He, he wants a relationship with you. It's not about rules or this or that. And I just began to pour out my heart to him about it's, a, it's talking about the love of Christ. And just really encouraging him and saying, look, I just want you to understand that, that I'm a, I'm, I believe in the word of God. I believe in the truth. I believe what God says in his word. But I also know that what? That God loves you right here, right now, just who you are. And I begin to see towards the end of the conversation, he, he kind of welled up. He didn't cry. He didn't, he didn't fall and repent and all of a sudden change his ways. It's not what I'm talking about. But when we had the conversation and we walked away, I said, I said, I said listen. I said, I, don't, I want you to do one thing for me. Just one thing. I'm only going to ask you to do one thing. I said, sometime, maybe tonight, maybe next week, maybe next year. I don't know when the time is going to come in your life. But at some point, you're going to lay down at night, put your head on your pillow one night, and this conversation we're having is going to repeat in your mind. And all I want you to do at that moment in time is I want you to say, God, if you're real, if you are who you say you are, I want you to show yourself to me. 
I want to know you. That, that's all I'm going to ask you to do. I said, can you, can you at least promise me that? And he said, yeah, sure, I promise. So I don't know if he's ever done it yet. I, I saw him again maybe two or three months ago. We had a nice conversation. We didn't talk about that night. But you know what? I'm sure I'm going to see him again, and, and maybe that will come up. But the point, the reason I wanted to share that story in the middle of, of what we're talking about, in the middle of this good story about the Good Samaritan, is how do we behave? How should we behave? I mean, to, to hear him say, when I heard those hurtful things, I thought, how could I serve a God or go to a church that believes that about me? And that's the reality of where we have to understand how we should behave. When it talks about loving your neighbor as yourself, what must we do? How are we supposed to behave? Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Let's read this real quick. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. And this is a familiar passage, and it says this. But God demonstrates or manifests his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, while we were sinners, he died for us. You see, Christ displayed his love. He demonstrated his love, not in words. He didn't tell you a good story about how you should be a good believer and how you should walk and this and that. He, he demonstrated sacrificial love for us. He died on the cross. While we were sinners, he died on the cross. You, know, you go through the whole theory of, of, of what's going on on the cross and how Christ is hanging there. And, and, and what, what you have to, and again, I like to try to imagine this because I can't imagine doing it in the flesh, but he's walking down the street. He's already been whipped and beaten. His beard's been pulled out. He's been spit on. Everybody hates him. And, and the whole time he's doing that, not one time does he not forgive everybody that's doing it and love everybody that's doing it to him. How do you do that? You can't do it in and of yourself, right? It requires something different. It requires the Spirit of God living inside of you and empowering you to love in the middle of that circumstance. When he was hanging on the cross, he had already forgiven all those that were in front of him. He loved them. He loved them. And he said, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's an amazing thought process. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. It's another similar scripture. And I want to read verses, um, I'll read 7 through 11. It says this. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. You see, God loved us. He sent his only son so that his son would be the payment for our sins. If God loved us so much, but then he says what? That we also must love one another. And it's talking about the believers and the non-believers. I believe it's both. And sometimes, quite honestly, it's harder to, be, it's harder to love the believer than it is the non-believer. Right? I mean, sometimes the, the body's more difficult. And you, you don't understand why that's true, but it's true sometimes. And I'm sure that I'm that person to some of you in this room. You're thinking, gosh, we really got to love that guy? Are you kidding me? He's killing me. And I understand that. And that's okay. That's okay. The, the, the truth of the reality is, though, is that what? God calls us to love like he loved. You can't do it without the Spirit of God living and dwelling inside of you. The reality is, is that we're to love everybody and not just, not just those we like. There's a, there's a quote from a movie that I have to throw out there. And, 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 I, and I hesitate to do it only because some of you will get it and not get it. It's, it, it because it, when I think about this particular thing that you have to love people even though they maybe rub you the wrong way, you're not sure you like them, but you've got to love them, and how does that work exactly right? So there, here's the quote, and I'm sure Josh Singleton will know it. I don't know half of you as well as, as I should like, and I like less than half of you half as well as you deserve. So there you have it, Okay. It's, you know, and again, you got to think through that statement to figure out exactly where it is. And those of you that know that statement, go. Anyways, uh, the, the point is what? Is that we need to love like Christ loved. That we need to reach out and extend the love of Christ. We are to be Christ to everybody we come in contact with. And how do you do that in a daily life 
when you're constantly being bombarded by the things of this world, challenging everything you believe? How did Christ do it when he walked down that road and they, they did all the things that they did to him? And he still showed love. The spirit that lives in us is the same spirit that lived in him and helped him get through that as he walked. He was all man and he was all God, but he relied on the spirit of God to help him. John 15, 13. Let's turn there real quick. Real quick. John 15, 13. It says this. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You see, love can only be known by the actions that it prompts. Love can only be known by the actions that it prompts. You see, love isn't a passive word when we talk about the love of Christ. Love is an action word. It it requires a response. It requires you to go and do something. It requires you to, to, to step out of your safety zone, to, to engage people that you normally wouldn't engage, to go out of your way to be Christ to somebody that is difficult for you to be Christ to, whatever it is. But love requires action. And if there's no action, it's not true love. It's not passive. God requires us to behave like him. Words will never persuade anybody the way actions do. Words will never persuade the way actions do. I remember growing up in my house, and those of you that have been in, underneath my mom in any way, shape, or form in Sunday school or at mom's, you've heard this statement. More is caught than taught. Who here has heard that before? See, it's working, mom. <laughs> but it's true, is it not? It's true. You can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And about the third word, all they hear is wah, 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 wah. <laughs> right? And they'll listen and shake their head and say, yes, and I love you, and that's it, right? That's, that's all you're going to get. And you think, I'm not sure if they really got that or not. My son uh, likes country western music, and he sent me a, a song. I heard a, a bit, I don't know, good or bad, I don't, you know. I'm, I really don't mind country music, to be honest with you. Um, anyways, so he sends me this song a couple of years ago, I don't know, three, four years ago what it was. And the name of the song is Watching You. And those of you that don't know or like country western music, the words basically, or the gist of the song is basically this. Dad's driving down the street with his kid in the back. He got him a Happy Meal. Guy cuts him off. He slams on the brakes. He spills everything. And the kid swears. He looks back and he goes, where'd you learn that? He goes, I've been watching you, Dad. (laughs) Right? So a little later on, the guy gets home. He goes to his barn by himself. He prays. He asks God to help himself get out of his own way because he's going to cause his kids to behave incorrectly. And so then he goes to tuck his son into bed, and his son says, hang on, Dad, i got to pray. He gets on his knees, begins to pray, and he says he prays like he knows who God is. And I said, son, where did you learn that? He says, I've been watching you, Dad. I've been watching you. So, okay, that's a good country western song, right? Okay. So, so the, the reality of it is, though, is isn't that the truth? And when I got the song the first time, I thought geez, I teach my son to swear? I started thinking, have I missed it somewhere, right? Then I got to the second verse. I'm like, okay, I'm all right. The the, the point is this. The point is this. Everywhere you go, and it's not just your children, it's non-believers that will watch every move you make, every action you take. If If you steal time from the company because you know you can, you go outside and you hang out and you spend a lot of time at the water cooler and you're the, you know, you're the local gossip and you don't really take, you know, you don't take your work seriously. And then you tell them, you try to share your belief system to them. They're going to go, that's a Christian. You're the person that shows up at 729. When, when work starts at 730, you leave at 1159 for lunch. You get back at 101 from lunch and you leave at 359. You're not going to put any extra time in. You're not going to, you're not going to be the dedicated worker that you need to be. If you're that person and you profess Christ, really? Look, they watch you every step, every word that comes out of your mouth, everything you do. And look, none of us are perfect. But the other side of that coin is that when you make a mistake and they come to you, you know what? Hey, you know what? You're right. You're right. I make mistakes just like you do. I blow it. I'm just as human as you are. There's no, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Christ responds to the lawyer and says, you've answered correctly. He basically pats him on the back and says, hey, great job. But then, but then you, and I, all I could hear was Jay Vernon's McGee, Jay Vernon McGee's head in my, 
Jay Vernon McGee's voice in my head, because this is where the rubber meets the road. Because Christ adds a caveat to that statement. He says, hey, you answered correctly. Great job. However, go and do this, and you will live. See, he takes the lawyer's own words. Go and do this, and you will live. He tells him, do this, and you shall live. The lawyer's in trouble, and he knows it. And as, he gets that, he's, as Christ says that to him, what does he do? He skips right over the whole first commandment, doesn't he? He bypasses the whole part about love God and goes right to the whole neighbor thing. Because he's thinking, I know I haven't met the first one, and I don't want to get embarrassed, so I'm going to go to the second one thinking, I got this one made. Right? He's thinking, I'm in. He says, so what, who's your neighbor? And Christ says, well, let me tell you who your neighbor is. And, and, and the reason that the lawyer asked this question is this. The Jewish leaders at that time, the basic rule of thumb was, your neighbor is anybody that's Jewish. Any Gentile, anybody who doesn't believe what we believe, they're not your neighbor. You don't have any responsibility to help them if they're not doing well. You don't have any responsibility to save them if they're going to die or offer them any help. You don't have any responsibility to them. None. Your neighbor is another Jew. So he's thinking in his own mind, I'm good. I've always been good and nice and kind to my neighbors. I've always helped them. When, when he was at a job, I took him a bag of groceries. When, when his daughter was sick, I made him soup. When, you know, I'm kind to all the Jewish people. And see, that's why the lawyer asked the question. I love the fact that just Christ just sets him up the whole time. He's just whittling down, down the thing. In his mind, he's thinking, I've got it. Christ begins to walk the lawyer down a path he'll never return from. Thus we come to the parable of the Good Samaritan, a Jewish man on his way from Jericho to Jerusalem or vice versa, and, and, and he's on his way, and, the, and, and here's the great thing about what the, the parable that Christ speaks about. He actually uses a road that is well-traveled, not only by priests and Levites and the different religious people that are on their way to, uh, to, to serve at the temple, but he speaks it based on the fact that, what, it's a thoroughfare for business, and there really were robbers on that road. And it probably had happened, if you probably picked up the paper three days later, you probably would have read about some guy that got waylaid, right? And so the example that he gives to the lawyer is, 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 could almost be factual. And, and so what happens is they take the robber, I mean, the robbers take the Jewish man, they beat him, they strip him, they take all of his money, and they leave him in the gutter to die. What does a well-traveled path in that time and age look like? They rode donkeys, mules, you know, camels. It would rain, it would be all muddy and dirty and gross, right? It wasn't a clean road. It's not like the, walking down the highway. I mean, he must have been filthy, right, when he, when he was there. And, the, and, and what's amazing is his own brethren, the Levite and the priest, both Jewish people that were called into the ministry to serve, go over there. In fact, the Levite actually walks up and looks at him and says, uh-uh, I'm not getting involved in that. But they both go by and pretend there's nothing there. These were men that should have been teaching, love your neighbor as yourself. These were men that should have understood the reality of what being Christ is to somebody who needs help. But instead of that, they cross on the other side of the street saying, I don't want anything to do with you. How, how horrible that is. How much animosity, how much hatred must be in you to walk by somebody. And the reality of it is they don't know if it's, if it's a Gentile or a Jew, but they leave him there anyways because there's no compassion in them. There's not Christ inside of them. Both men were called into service of God, and they should have been examples, and they weren't. And yet this man, this, this Samaritan, on his own accord, sees this man laying there, and to the, to the Jewish people, the, the Samaritans were the least, the least of human beings. They were like worse than dogs, the Samaritans were. They didn't like them. They had no dealings with them. They didn't want anything to do with them. And so when you realize the reason Christ picked the Samaritan, helping a Jew, how that would look to the lawyer. And the, and, and the lawyer now is realizing, I'm in serious trouble with, with my conversation. But the Samaritan stops by. He picks him up. He, 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 he cleans his wounds best he can, puts him on his own uh, animal, and they takes him to an inn. And when he gets there, he, he pays the innkeeper to take care of him. He gets help for him. He dresses his wounds. He says, listen, I'm going to leave and go do my business now. But when I get back, if there's anything lacking, I want you to know I'll take care of it. And at that moment in time, what happens? Christ turns and he says to the lawyer, which of these three was a neighbor to the one who befell the robbers? You know, I've read this parable many, many times, and until this time, I never dawned on me the way 
the, the way the lawyer responds. The lawyer responds to him and he says this, the one who showed mercy. You see, Christ gave three distinct titles, a, a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan. The lawyer in the middle of this conversation, now that he's being questioned by Christ, he doesn't even have the ability to say it was the Samaritan. There's no way he's going to say the Samaritan. He's not going to give credit to a Samaritan. And so now all of a sudden his heart really shows, right? He's not there to ask, what shall I do to enter the kingdom? He's not there to give it, And he's not going to give any credit to a Samaritan for helping a Jew. Because if he does that, that means that when Christ responds, which his next response to the Samaritan was what? Go and do this and you will live. That would mean that if he were walking home and he saw a Samaritan on the road, he would have to stop and help him. You see, out of, the, out of the lawyer's own mouth, his own condemnation, the own reality. See, he tried to get away with not even dealing with the first commandment and talking about to love the Lord your God with all your heart, heart with soul, and mind. Instead, he thought, I got it wrapped up. I'm going to go with this one. And, and, and trying to justify himself, trying to get a pat on the back that he was good and he was earning his, his, his stripes. But the reality of it is, is that Christ turned it on him once again. And what, what, a, what a shame that this man wouldn't even, give, wouldn't even say it was the Samaritan. Christ finishes again when he says, go and do likewise. And I think tonight, this morning as we, as we wrap this up, the, the, the thing I want to mention to you is this. This whole story is about how we're to behave and how we're to treat people. And, and when you look at it and you begin to apply it to where we are today, to society, to the things that we're up against. I truly believe that the more you show the love of Christ, the more you depict who Christ is and how he died for you, if that's what you reflect to people, people are going to be drawn to you. People are going to want to know who Christ is. People are going to listen when you speak to them. But if you have that righteous and that holier-than-thou attitude when you speak to people about stuff, when you are a, no way, we're going to rise up and we're going to do this and that, that's not, that's not what the Word of God says. You think, and again, those words that he spoke to me that night at dinner echo in my mind every time I come in contact with somebody. When I heard those horrible words, when I heard what they thought about me, why would I ever go back to a church or serve a God that says and thinks those types of things about me? You know how hard it's going to be to ever change that man's thought process of who Christ is, of who we are as believers and Christians? You think he, don't pre, he didn't prejudge who I was the minute I said I believe in Jesus Christ or the Word of God? I guarantee you he did. And my only hope is I could be a good enough witness that at some point in time he will really truly see and try to find out who Christ is in his life. I don't want to be a body of Christ that makes people not want to come to church. I don't want to be a body of Christ that causes people to look around and say, oh, well, you guys, you you don't like what I do, you don't believe me, you you, you treat me differently because I look funny, or whatever it might be. What I want to be is I want to show the love of Christ. I want people to come in because, and look, we are a good church at that. I'm not just saying Zion, okay? I'm saying the whole body as a whole, but we as a church, man, you walk in the door, you are loved when you walk in this door. That is a given. And, and, and I, my, my encouragement is let's continue to do that in the midst of what? An onslaught of who we are as believers. Let's continue to love on those that walk on the door. Let, let's continue to be light in a dark place. But what? Let's show the compassion and the love of Christ. Let's be like the Samaritan that stopped. And what did he do? He sacrificed. He gave of his own money. He gave of his own time. He had to what? Probably miss the business meeting he was on his way to. But he did it because why? He had compassion. And the, who he had compassion on, it wasn't in his mind a Jew. He didn't know if he was a Jew or a Gentile or what he was. All he knew was this man needs help. He looked at another human being and he knew that there was a soul at stake. And he thought, I have to do something for that man. <laughs> That's what we're supposed to be. That's who we are supposed to be inside to love one another, to love Christ, to be be who we're supposed to be. 
My challenge to you this morning as we, as we close and as you go home is really quite simple. It's, it's basically this. I'm gonna, we're going to sing a song, and, and I'm going to close in prayer. And, and basically, I would, I would really hope that each one of us would really truly go home and say, God, if I've been that person, if I've been the priest or the Levite, if I've acted that way in any way, shape, or form, God, I don't want that in me. And look, it, 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 we've all done it, right? I'm not sitting here telling you that I've been perfect and I've always been the, the Samaritan. Probably more times than not, I haven't been the Samaritan. And that's why this word is for me is as much for anybody else. But what I'm telling you is that we got to strive to be the Samaritan in that story. we got to strive to act in a way that brings honor to who God is, that brings honor to the love of Christ. So we're going to sing whatever it is that they want to sing, and then we're going to close in prayer. <laughs> Let's sing, Lord, I give you my heart. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. And every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake. Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take. blessing over each person in this room. God, I ask that your spirit would, would fall on each person, God, that you would speak to them. That, Lord, as they search their hearts and their minds and they ask for the love of Christ, that, Lord, that they would reflect that love. That, God, that they would take inside of them, Lord God, and that they would be changed forevermore. God, I ask, God, that you would change me from the inside out. God, give me a love for the lost. Give me a love for the hungry and the hurting. Give me a love for the down and out and those that don't know you that are deceived, Lord God. Give me a love for those that are so lost in the world that they're looking for something that will change their life. God, we have the life that can change them forever. We have the one thing that can save their souls from eternal damnation. But God, they will never hear it if we don't meet them at their level. They will never hear it if we can't show compassion and a heart that truly says, I love you regardless of what you look like or act like or smell like or behave like. That isn't what we depend upon. We depend upon the love of Christ that's inside of each one of us. So Lord, I pray a blessing over each person. Bless them as they go. Bring them back safe later in the week, God. Keep the family safe, God. Move in every person's life. We pray for healing for those that need to be healed. Comfort for those that need to be comforted. God, only you meet the needs that need to be met. Bless this day, we pray, and everyone said, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for coming. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul.